thank you all for joining us for the Salt Marsh Bank Talk Encore webinar. Our focus today will be on the new mortgage servicing rules or after 17 months of pandemic, where are we now? I am with McGlinchey Stafford as are my presenters and we are a national law firm. For our purposes today, we have a robust active compliance practice in the consumer financial services area, as well as a national litigation practice with more than 100 litigators. I am located in the Irvine office and I practice in both fields. Our second speaker today is Sean Ramey. He heads up our Nashville office and he's a Tennessee litigator. He's also licensed in Alabama and licensed in Florida and works on litigation issues on a national scope, focusing on the Southeast and anywhere else that there's consumer financial services. Chris heads up our Birmingham, Alabama office and is a litigator. And he and I have worked together on a bunch of matters, including out here in California and elsewhere. And we're gonna share with you today some of our experience dealing with default mortgage servicing from a litigation and compliance perspective. As an overview, when the pandemic began in March, things happened. What we may have noticed is the economy shut down, employment rocketed up, and mortgage delinquencies went up. If you look at the chart in front of us, if my cursor is working, Chris, can you see my cursor or is it not useful here? So when you look at the cursor, you can see where the pandemic occurred. If you think back to how this works in the real world, we had a pandemic, economy shut down, unemployment rocketed up, mortgage delinquencies happened. The last time this happened, we gave it a name, we called it the Great Recession. The last time there was a blip in the mortgage market where things slowed down was 1990-ish or so. That's when I bought my house, put money into it, and then watched it drop in value. If you go back even further, back to the early 80s when we had our last recessionary crisis, yeah, as you can see, what's old is new again, which leads us to, okay, let's look. As you can see, typically from 2020 going backwards, mortgage delinquencies, not foreclosures, mortgage delinquencies held in there between four, four and a half percent. At the start of the pandemic, they doubled and rocketed up to eight and have slowly been coming down. So now we're saying, is this time different? We're looking at massive market failures, threats to the financial system, borrowers who can't make payments. The primary differences this time are the way the government reacted to the crisis. In March 2020, we had the CARES Act where the government assumed the burden and responsibility for the economy. And in the mortgage market, where two thirds of the mortgages are backed by Fannie, Freddie, VA, FHA, and USDA, the government said they would bear the risk of loss. We want to help borrowers and homeowners. We're going to reduce paperwork, provide help to the industry. Let's talk about what they did, where we are, and what we can expect. I want to start with the foreclosure and eviction moratoriums. If you're following in this area, what we want to share is the summary. Under the CARES Act, March 27, 2020, the government said a mortgage servicer for a covered loan insured by Fannie Freddie, FHA, VA, or USDA may not initiate a foreclosure, move for a foreclosure judgment, or execute a foreclosure-related eviction or foreclosure sale. Three milestones. The FHFA, who regulates Fannie and Freddie, jumped in and said, yep, you got to suspend all this for 60 days. Fannie adopted a milestone approach saying, no initiation of a non-judicial foreclosure sale. The VA and USDA did milestone approaches saying you can't do certain tasks. And HUD with the FHA said, no, 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 we're stopping all of foreclosures. All of these moratorium expired July 31st, and if they come back, they'll be in place. You need to look at it. The other reason to point this out is as you get ready to start foreclosures, you want to look at your portfolio and make sure that you have properly followed the moratorium and either didn't violate a milestone or didn't violate the process. Under any circumstances, check state law. Once the foreclosure takes place, 
We have eviction-related moratoriums following the foreclosures. All of the agencies have stopped post-foreclosure evictions through September 30th. What does that mean for us? What that means for us is watch your emails next week because the agencies will come out with possible extensions. Don't know what will happen. Okay, so there is no foreclosure moratorium. What about on the eviction side? So Sean, what, is the, what have the feds done? Well, you know, if it was only that easy, Sandy, if we were truly at the end of all the moratoriums, that would be fantastic. But uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau issued a final rule in late June essentially extending the moratoriums through the end of the year. Now, when I say extending them, I'm talking about no first notice type issues. So specifically, what the CFPB said was that if certain loans, really two conditions here, one, that the loan went into 120 days default on or after March 1st, basically, was the default, did the default coincide with the pandemic, that it would be applicable, this rule, and two, if no statute of limitations was going to pass by December 31st, it would apply. So essentially what the CFPB said was that you're gonna to have to take certain steps if you want to initiate a new foreclosure action, first notice type steps. And we're gonna talk a little bit about those steps. And if you don't, then you need to wait until after, until 2022 to do so. Um, now, once again, I said there were two important points there. One was we're talking about loans that went into default, 120 days default after on or after March 1st, meaning if a loan had just been in foreclosure already <clears throat> and had been stayed because of the various moratoriums, then you can continue. We're talking about brand new first filings. That's why we equate this to essentially being a moratorium. Second of all, though, and the one that's really important to note is with, you know, we're coming down towards the end of the year. We typically have holiday moratoriums anyways. A lot of lenders are frankly, and servicers are, are hesitant to start new foreclosures anyways until 2022. And that would, in general, be a very good conservative approach to take unless you're going to run into a statute of limitations problem, which New York City is one of those, or New York, the state, is one of those, those states. So, for example... If your statute of limitations is going to come up in November or in December of this year, you're going to need to go ahead and initiate that foreclosure action. You cannot rely upon the fact and simply state that, well, the action was stayed or told because of the CFPB's rules because it does not apply in that circumstance. So please keep that in mind. Um, so the rule, as I noted, because this is the CFPB is broader than the CARES Act because I'm talking, I'm not just talking about a rule that applies just to federally backed loans. I'm talking about a rule that applies to all loans with a few exceptions. Um, and the, I should have probably noted this, the time frame that although this was issued on June 28th, you will note that it became effective on August 31st, leaving a 60 day gap period there. Now, um, Fannie and Freddie went ahead or FHFA came in and filled that gap and said, with respect to our loans, you've got to go ahead and take these actions during that gap. But um, I'll throw out this trivia question. Um, does anyone know why there's a gap in the first place? Why wasn't it effective immediately upon passage? Anyone? Sandy, Mr. Schatz, you got any why? Okay, Sandy, read the answer. Major rules require sending off to Congress under the Congressional Review Act for a 60-day review. And when the rule came out June 29th, Congress had 60 days to review it, so the rule couldn't be effective till August 31st. My goodness, impressive, appreciate it. But um, so anyways, the big caution here is that while most moratoriums have lifted, we still have one that's effectively in place for first notice filings. But as noted, like anything, there are exceptions. Sandy, can you give me the next slide? Three exceptions specifically. Um, these exceptions are laid out here on the screen for you. But the first one is, and it's kind of the most obvious of the exceptions is, and the whole purpose of the rule is to get the servicer to evaluate a complete loss mitigation package. Meaning, if the servicer has reached out to the borrower, the borrower has submitted a complete package, that complete package has been evaluated, um, the borrower remains delinquent, did not become current, and they otherwise do not qualify and have exhausted their appeal time, then you can go ahead and go forward with the foreclosure action. 
that's a lot of steps though to take place in the next three months. The second one, which is a little tricky and something you should always reach out to local council about is this does not apply to abandoned properties. Note, abandoned is not necessarily the same thing as vacant, so you have to check your state law. Vacancy often is synonymous almost, but that's just sometimes one step under state law as to whether a borrower has abandoned the property. And the last but not least is essentially if the borrower is non-responsive to outreach, you know, you've reached out to them in all the proper ways that you're supposed to as set forth here, and they just haven't responded, then you can proceed with, with foreclosure. So please keep that CFPB rule in mind. Uh, next slide, Sandy. We yeah, what can, is the impact of this rule then, Sandy? I'll throw that right back at you. We can kind of summarize the impact is think of my mom. When Sandy. I came home years ago after doing something at school or in sports and not succeeding, my mom said, well, you did your best and that's what counts. The no initiation of foreclosures, you reach out to the borrower, you consider an application, you offer them choices, and nothing works, my mom would approve. She said, well, you did your best. The second exception listed here is also my mom's rule. My mom isolated during the pandemic. After a year and a half of pandemic, I got the word and all of us kids could go visit mom. And we spent five days in Florida visiting mom. We all flew home on Monday and I called mom on Wednesday to say thank you for a wonderful week visiting you. And mom said, I haven't heard from you in two days. You don't write, you don't call, it's my mom. What can I tell you? The same thing here, you try and reach the borrowers, they don't respond. You reach the borrower, they don't respond. You don't write, you don't call, you can foreclose if you've tried a bunch of times. Remember, this only applies to COVID-related issues. If the borrower is a long-term delinquent, the rule doesn't apply. You've now finished your foreclosure and you want to do an eviction. Where are we on evictions, Sean? Yeah, certainly. Um, evictions have been a little more complicated, and we're going to just touch base on this relatively briefly. I think you've, most people have read about this in the headlines, but you know, first related to this, the CDC entered an initial eviction order um, that was issued through the date of July 31st, 2021. And similar to the CFPB rule I was talking about earlier, this uh, eviction order was much broader than the CARES Act because it applied not just to federally backed loans and federal agency loans, this, this applied to all loans. And basically up until July 31st, obviously a date that's already passed, uh, no landlord could take actions. And that means also a lender who had foreclosed and hence become a landlord could not take any actions to evict a person a covered person from the property up to the date of July 31st. Uh, we don't have to go into all the details of what a covered person was, but it basically involved a person executing a very specific declaration where they set forth that they were impacted by COVID in some way and swore to certain elements. Um, and they also had certain limitations as far as how much money um, they made. And once again, this, um, this was something that applied to their, their residency. Note once again that this is an eviction only order, not a foreclosure order. So you can still go forward and foreclose despite the, the um, CDC's order. Now, as we're gonna talk about in a second, this is no longer applies, but we do wanna illustrate because you never know when the CDC is gonna come back with how serious they take the situation. And I point out this fine information for you. They took it so seriously that they were willing to not only impose actual you know, monetary fines, but also impose jail time for anyone who was violating this order. So something to always keep in mind because you never know what the next CDC order is going to be. Um, so this was the initial order, which came to some challenges. Next slide, Sandy. Um, this just kind of outlines some of the lawsuits that challenged the CDC order for various reasons. The most important opinion there being the first and the last, whereby the district, uh, the DCA and um, the District of Columbia basically stated that the, that the CDC did not have the power to issue this order, but that same judge issued a stay of her own order, and that stay went up to the Supreme Court of the United States, which was pr prior to the expiration, and very interestingly, Judge Kavanaugh, in a 5-4 opinion, sided with the uh, more liberal justices and actually basically said, yes, we agree that the CDC has exceeded its authorities, but 
you know, we're not too far away from July 31st, and this will give more time for Congress to dish out the federal funds, which we're going to talk about here in a moment. So, you know, let's just keep it in place. So that's what happened. Stayed in place. Next slide, Sandy. And of course, a few days after it lifted, the CDC put in a new order, despite Judge Kavanaugh's warning. And that new order um, was seeking to extend it out even further into October. And, um, we probably should note that part of the reason the CDC, you know, why does the CDC claim it has the power to do this in the first place? And it was basically through the Public Health Service Act where they were looking to have the ability to do this. And the general concept was that Congress has empowered certain groups who then power it down to other folks to deal with certain circumstances, to stop the spread of disease, which gives certain broad powers, including you know, being able to um, handle fumigation, disinfection, sanitation, extermination, things to stop the spread of disease. And basically the CDC was claiming that by having an eviction order in place, if you don't have an eviction order in place, people go out and are going to be homeless. And if they're homeless, they're more likely to contract and spread COVID and hence they had the power or they believe they had the power to, to do this. Well, sure enough, the Supreme Court spoke then again and said, no, you do not. Clearly you lack congressional authority. The order we were just talking about, the power we were talking about was too <clears throat> incorrect. So, um, so basically it was struck down again, which is why we say it was, was good through October. So there is no um, eviction order currently, currently in place. Um, Sandy, so what is the what is the what what is the takeaway from all of this? Remember how this came about under the CARES Act and the success for the CARES Act when Congress passed the federal foreclosure moratorium and eviction moratorium, Congress specifically said this applies only to federally backed mortgage loans so that Congress who owns these loans said, we don't want our borrowers to make payments. We don't want to evict tenants from our buildings unless, et cetera. And the feds were willing to bear that risk. When the servicers had to do the pass-throughs of the interest for months and the servicers said, whoa, 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 we can't afford to have this foreclosure moratorium. You got to help us out. The federal agencies at the direction of Congress said, no problem. Just do the pass-throughs for three months then file a claim and we'll give you back the money and Congress will bear the risk. For private mortgages, there was nothing. In the case of the CDC eviction order, just federal loans and federal properties, it was everybody, it was a gross overreach. So what Congress had done in various acts is created a homeowner assistance fund and said, we now have $47 billion out there which we're administering through states, territories, tribal programs, local housing finance agencies to help borrowers and tenants with mortgage and rental assistance. The 47 billion is still available out there. When Justice Kavanaugh did his review and opinion in the first case that Sean just talked about, only $3 billion of the money had been distributed. Now approximately $11 billion of the money is administered. Had Congress said, or the CDC said, exhaustion of remedies, we have rent money out there and you can't evict until you use our rent money or learn that you can't qualify, the CDC eviction moratorium should have happened and been upheld. But we as banks, as lenders for both mortgage people and for renters should tell our customers there's money available, go get the money, that way you can get the rental income in and pay our mortgage. Or if you are a borrower, go get the Federal Housing Assistance Fund money, all 47 billion of it, and pay your mortgage, and we're happy. Had that happened, even if the CDC eviction order isn't upheld as an election of remedies or a exhaustion of remedies thing, there is money available for our customers and we should encourage them to get it. Let's turn to what the states are doing let me go, go back to Sean. What are some of the state events happening? Shall we start with Florida? Yeah, sure. Uh, we're going to start with a few judicial states and a few non-judicial states. The map there kind of gives you an idea of which ones we're going to talk about. Florida being one of the larger states was one. Yeah, so there's our beautiful map, as you see. There's our states. And uh, we're just going to kind of hit these pretty quickly. Florida, um, 
you know, has had various rules in place. One of the most notable things with respect to Florida, which is a judicial state, is uh, there's a, sometimes a disconnect between what a judge thinks is the law and what actually is the law. And what we've seen a lot applied pretty inconsistently is whether a judge will stop a foreclosure. And a lot of times that comes down to whether or not it's an internal hold or whether it's an actual moratorium in place. So point being, if you're ABC servicer and you've decided you're not going to foreclose for whatever reasons you have, that's probably not gonna be a good enough reason with most judges in Florida to stop a foreclosure. But as you're familiar with Florida, it's often once you get that ball rolling, you've got to, you got to finish it through. You can't just stop its strength. Um, but if you can tie it to a moratorium, whether it be a local one or in Florida state, the situation is gonna to have to be federal, maybe talking about the CFPB rule, which really is just a first initiation. You'll wanna you'll wanna look into that. But Florida does have some things in the judicial system to require cases to keep moving. One was this 45-day stay rule, basically, where a case management order would have to be issued within 45 days of the moratoriums lifting. But frankly, as we talked about a second ago, most of the moratoriums <coughs> lifted at the end of July, so those 45 days have now been extended. So not a lot, really, with respect to Florida now. Go ahead and go to the next screen. New Jersey. This one's a little more complicated. Uh, New Jersey... Uh, basically has a, has a little different situation. They stop talk about removal. There's nothing that stops you from foreclosing. There's nothing that stops you from evicting a person, but there is something that stops you from removing the people from the property, typically through sheriffs or other agents. And that went into effect and was a protection New Jersey put into place. Um, and it is still in place at this time. Go ahead and go to the next page. Um, and this is just kind of outlining for you, for example, obviously we're always talking about residential properties, but I did want to go, go one more screen, if you will, Sandy. I really want to talk about this page, which was just how long is this in place? And weirdly enough, it's separated between a, a removal from a foreclosure and a removal related to an eviction. The foreclosure rule is in place until November 15th. That thus tells you you may not be able to actually remove the people from the property in New Jersey till, if it's related to a foreclosure till after mid-November. If it's related to an eviction, you have a different sliding scale time with respect to that. It depends upon the kind of default. It depends upon basically the person's income furthest date out would be the end of the year, essentially. And this applies to folks who um, have the least means or talking about low income or mid income people as defined by New Jersey. So the whole point of this group of slides with respect to New Jersey is there are some real um, provisions that are going to keep you from taking a property to REO in New Jersey, probably through the end of the year. But speaking of so, new, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, let's turn to New York if you're good. Yep. Yep, New York is a, another prime example. Um, New York ha it has a situation in place where the original act passed applies to residential foreclosures and evictions. It was originally stayed to a much earlier date, but now that stay goes all the way into the new year, it goes into January, which this is the furthest out that we've seen of anyone do yet. Note though that this is related to a hardship declaration, which is a form um, that can be served at any time in New York. So if a borrower is, um, you know, you get a judgment against them, but they still haven't given, filled out a hardship declaration, they can fill one out right before the sale, right before the notice of sale in order to stop the foreclosure into January 15th. Now, New York realized that some of these hardship declarations were um, not founded in good faith, so they did provide a mechanism so that lenders and servicers could challenge them. But the problem is your ability to challenge them with extensions that Crafty Debtors Council can get, most likely you're not going to be able to challenge it effective before the expiration of January 15th, but you have every single right to do so if you're in a unique circumstance. So New York, good example of it being extended all the way out there. Um, next slide, Sandy, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say there. Um, in general, this is most of the same uh, situations I think we've seen about how it applies to tax foreclosures, um, negative credit reporting, credit discrimination, tax renewal exemptions as well. So um, let's go ahead and move on to a few of the non-judicial states now. 
Chris, how's Arkansas looking? Well, we wanted to include Arkansas because it has sort of a, a unique approach to how it's handling this uh, uh, evictions and, and foreclosures. Um, they, there's no statewide order, but they have vested the presiding judge in each county with the power and discretion to permit or, or deny foreclosures and evictions based on the conditions in that county at the time. So um, there's no reason, you know, other than any federal rules that might have prohibited it at one time for servicers not to move forward with foreclosure. Just know that um, if you get a judge uh, in a county that decides that the uh, disease spread is too high, they can, in their discretion, uh, halt the foreclosure or eviction process. I do want to mention California only because I'm there and the short version for what we are talking about now is tenants have to pay something, complete a declaration for COVID related relief. And the state wants you to know that there's state rental assistance available. So if you are a landlord before you evict, you have to go to the state and try and get the money. If you get the money, can't evict because you've been paid. And if you can't get the money, Go ahead and complete your eviction. A lot of this is in effect through the end of the year, and we don't know if it'll be extended further. There are about a thousand bills on the governor's desk. He has till October 10th to sign them. Let me turn back to Georgia, Chris. Yeah, Georgia doesn't have any statewide moratoria like uh, Arkansas. Uh, some of the courts have an in, uh, discretion as to whether evictions are going to be allowed. I can tell you um, that. Although it's a non-judicial state, if, if you do have a situation where a borrower counterclaims and you have to uh, deal with a lawsuit there or files a lawsuit based on the non-judicial foreclosure, um, the courts are extremely backlogged. Um, you're looking at trial dates, that initial trial dates not being set for at least a year, probably closer to two in most of the counties. Is that the summary eviction process is expedited in less than two years? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear you. Is that how we have a summary eviction process? It's expedited yes. to be less than two years? Yes, yes. Well, maybe you are in California. Who knew? Okay, Tennessee, Sean, what can you tell us? Sure, we listed this because I think we received an inquiry about Tennessee, which is also my resident state. Um, Tennessee did have an eviction moratorium in place at the beginning of the pandemic, but it has expired. So there is nothing in Tennessee from a state level or locally that prevents you from proceeding with either foreclosure or eviction. Chris, can we turn to Texas for what the current update situation is? Well, Texas just there's no statewide order. They do have a, a an emergency order that's going to expire next Friday. But uh, for those of you that are uh, trying to make a decision between now and Friday, uh, you've got to comply with emergency order 39, which basically uh, is a diversion program that now allows plaintiffs and defendants to get together and evaluate whether eviction is what they really want to do. Um, and there's certain disclosures you have to make. Uh, essentially, um, uh, they just want to make sure that uh, the landlords have um, access to the federal money and time to you know, evaluate all their opportunities and options. I want to turn and look at some litigation issues in this space and see what some of our borrowers and tenants have done or tried to do. Let's start with Sean. Yeah, I just want to touch base on um, litigation related to the claim that a servicer, lender, landlord violated a foreclosure eviction moratorium. Two things I just want to say about it. First on this slide is the first theory or the first defense, which is do, you, do they even have a private cause of action to sue you? Do they have a right to sue you because you violated the CARES Act or you violated a particular moratorium? There actually isn't any case law directly on point, but there is case law in analogous situations, specifically in the, you know, the PPP loan aspect where courts have stated that there is not a private cause of action. So I did want to just note that um, in the event you do get one of those challenges. Um, now I'll give you an illustration of how that is, those challenges come up on the next screen. We saw this specific case, for example, in Florida, this Pierre case versus Albertelli and Lender. And the way it comes up basically is a borrower saw a loan documentation, saw that it was a HUD loan 
saw that the foreclosure had been initiated before the HUD moratorium had lifted and filed a lawsuit claiming the viol that the lender and the uh, debt collector, the foreclosure firm, had violated the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, as well as Florida's ancillary of that, the um, Florida Collection Practices Act, basically claiming it was a harassing, abusive, oppressive conduct. Um, and it would have been a pretty good theory, and it's the kind of theory you would see come because it also gets them attorney's fees. But um, thankfully for the lender in that case, what first at first blush appeared to be a violation of the moratorium turned out not to be one. Um, specifically, the case was voluntarily dismissed once proof was presented that while this started as a HUD-backed loan, it had actually been purchased out of HUD a long, long time ago, long before the um, foreclosure had started. And the proof that supported that was an assignment of mortgage, a goodbye letter showing that it had transferred to another entity, and even going so far as to pull up a HUD lender inquiry showing showing the termination of a HUD insurance claim. So I just kind of give you that as an illustration of, you know, if you get one of these on your desk, don't freak out at first. There may be a, a valid reason why it happened as it did. So how can we sum up the foreclosure and eviction area and what can you do now? Let me share a couple of thoughts. We have seen very few foreclosures and evictions because of federal moratorium, state moratorium, and local moratorium, but that bubble is scheduled to burst in January. Right now, we're encouraging servicers to evaluate their foreclosure portfolio, take a look at your loans in default, and see where you are, where you are in the foreclosure process. If you've gotten this far in foreclosure, have you complied with all of the federal and state guidelines? If not, now is the time to start over or tee up for a redo. If you have done it correct, correctly so far, then you can proceed. Also, if you're using outside counsel or foreclosure trustees, have them do a double check to make sure that they are in compliance. Our second point is, again, reach out to borrowers and consider loss mitigation relief. There's all sorts of programs at the federal and state level, and there's money available. If you can help a borrower keep their home or reinstate their mortgage, you win. Third thing, prepare to foreclose. Get all the ducks in a row now, get the foreclosure systems ready to go. So on January 2, when you push the button, you're ready to go and don't need to wait till January 9. Well, next tip is triage your loans. There are many loans that are good for foreclosure, but far, far more may be amenable to some approach. And remember my mom, you reach out and try and get hold of them, and you try and get hold of them, and you try and get hold of them, and they don't write, they don't call, you're good to go and you can feel good about it. But Fannie and Freddie and my conversations with them want you to make contact, reach out to the borrowers and have contact. And once you do, we'll talk about how to handle that now. But borrowers want to keep their home, they want to keep their equity. So we'll move into what can we do? The feds under the CARES Act started a forbearance program. Remember that forbearance was available prior to the CARES Act. Fannie and Freddie had robust forbearance programs. And in fact, as of March 2, 2020, one quarter percent of all loans were already in forbearance. By June 7th, three months into the pandemic, eight and a half percent of all loans were in forbearance, and it had just rocketed up and exploded. We went from almost no borrowers to 4.3 million homeowners. Those numbers have been coming down steadily since then as we learn to deal with forbearance. If you do better with graphs, here's a picture of the explosion of forbearance and then how it drops out. We've got different colors for Ginny, Annie, Freddie, private loans, and then the total percentage rates of forbearance. Who is in forbearance? Well, Fannie and Freddie have very low percentages in forbearance, 1.47 as of our latest MBA statistics. Ginny has a bunch in private label securities are at 7% of their loans are in forbearance. As a percentage of servicing volume, we've come down to 3.47%, and we've seen forbearance decline for 25 straight weeks. That's almost six months, half a year of declining. When we take a look at forbearance, 11% of borrowers are in the first term, the first six months. 80% of forbearance people are in extended terms. That's not good. Those are the folks who are in for seven to 12 months or 13 to 18 months. 
and about eight and a half percent of forbearance people have just re-entered forbearance. They were in it and they exited. When borrowers exit from forbearance, yes, this time is different. More than a quarter of them take a deferral or partial claim. Typically what that is, is the entire foreborn amount is added to the end of the loan. A little under a quarter of the borrowers, 21.9% who were in forbearance, in the end didn't need it, they just stayed current. About 12% of borrowers exited with a full reinstatement, they just paid back how much they had not paid. 11% of borrowers exited with a mod or a trial plan. 7% of the borrowers paid off their loan through a refinance or home sale. And 1% did a short sale or deed in lieu. Okay, our problem is gonna be the 16.4% who left forbearance without anything in place. These are the people who are teeing up for foreclosure. They're in colossal despair or denial. And that's where our work comes in. We must reach out and get hold of them or if they don't write and don't call, we'll end up foreclosing. I show the Fannie Mae statistics here. What you see is in a pie graph, most borrowers do something and our traditional mods back from the Great Recession is the yellow. It's the 1.6% and the 2.3% of borrowers who got the mods, everyone else did a partial claim or paid their money. It's a different world now. Freddie has similar numbers. You can see payment deferrals and partial claims. Most borrowers who exit just did a, I didn't pay for a year and a half, add it to the end of the loan, I'll start making payments now. Okay, will this last forever? Are we gonna have forbearance forever? Chris? Uh, no, we are not. Um, and uh, the, as Sandy indicated uh, earlier, the, the key for you as servicers is going to be to reach out to your borrowers and stay in constant and regular and strategic contact with them. Um, the CARES Act only applies during the covered period. And if you are really interested and want to read the various sections, there's about 17 definitions of what the covered period is. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about that at another time if, uh, if you have any questions about it. Um, Fannie and Freddie, there's no deadline today for applying for forbearance, but um, while there's a pool of money that's uh, readily available, we believe everybody should be scrambling for it and um, moving for uh, requesting forbearance as quickly as they can. Uh, HED, HUD, FHA, and VA, you've got to apply by next Thursday, I believe, is the 30th, and uh, your forbearance is going to expire on uh, the 30th of next June. So um, that's uh, how about next slide. Okay. Um, one thing to talk about, uh, though, is, uh, well, hold on a second. Excuse me, guys. Okay, so I, I like to analogize this to the old real estate adage, you know, what's the key to real estate success? Location, location, location. Uh, the key to success for you right now is outreach, outreach, outreach. Um, there is There are a lot of benefits to regular and strategic communication with your borrowers so that you can identify where you're going to have problems, who you can help, and go on and start triaging those uh, files and, and documenting them properly. It's really important that you have a script for your customer service reps to use. Uh, if you don't have one, Fannie and Freddie have excellent scripts that they are happy for you to use. You could get them off their website. If for some reason you have trouble, reach out to one of us. We'd be happy to provide it to you. If you want to create your own, uh, that's fine too. If you want somebody to look at it and make sure you've checked off all the right boxes, we'd be happy to do that as well. But, but the goal is for you to have uh, a playbook for your people to use when they're communicating with your borrowers. And you want to be able to demonstrate after the fact that you have done everything you can to help keep your borrowers in their home and to preserve their equity. And um, I am a big fan of phone calls followed up by documentation and the servicing notes followed up by a letter that says, per our conversation recently, and then run the script in the letter. And that way you have plenty of documentation for after the fact. Um, next slide, please. Okay, the, the CFPB in its um, ongoing effort to keep life interesting 
has come up with some new uh, live contact requirements. Um, and the requirements are fairly simple. There's two tracks. If you've got a borrower that's in forbearance, you're going to go down one track. If you've got a borrower that is not in forbearance, you're going to go down another track. And essentially, this is another opportunity for you to create a strong record of proper uh, efforts to rehab these, these borrowers. Um, so make the calls, use the script, record the calls, document it in your servicing notes, and follow up with communications or in write, written communications that document everything you've told them already. And the, the key here is, you know, remember there's a lot of federal money out there available for these borrowers and for landlords, and um, you need to request forbearance and uh, try to get that money while you can for the borrowers. Okay, so uh, when I think about this sort of waterfall of uh, options available for borrowers, it reminds me of the Roadrunner and Coyote cartoons. If you remember, the coyote was perpetually falling off something and it wasn't good enough for him to fall straight to the ground. He bounced off several hard objects on the way down. Well, in this case, uh, the uh, borrowers are hitting one soft pillow after another one until they cascade to the ground and rest. But, you know, uh, if a repayment plan doesn't work, then step down and offer them a, a pay it, payment deferral. Um, if that doesn't work, let's try to extend the terms or lower your interest rate. If that doesn't work, let's talk about a, a short sale. And all the way down to the final uh, option where the federal government has actually um, you know, agreed that you can reduce their pay, uh, excuse me, their UPV and reduce their principal and interest payments as well. Uh, Sandy, what about the loss mitigation enhancements? So the agencies, Fannie and Freddie, in cooperation with the Bureau's amended rules, now permit servicers to consider less than complete applications in order to offer a loss mitigation solution. Recall Pre-pandemic, under the loss mitigation rules, a servicer must obtain a complete application, consider every single alternative, and then offer the borrower options for which they qualify. Because some borrowers may not want certain options, and in the pandemic panoply of choices, under the current rules, temporary rules, a servicer can take a partial application for a specific item and avoid the anti-evasion rule and offer the borrower a solution. Those rules are currently in effect, and as long as we're helping borrowers, they can keep being used. So what do you need to know now? Remember the federal forbearance programs apply to two thirds of all mortgages, those backed or guaranteed or insured by the federal government, but other forbearance programs are out there. If borrowers qualify for forbearance, whether it's federally backed or private, offer it. And then when they're in forbearance, continue the outreach so that you can get borrowers out of forbearance into performance, whether it's through a deferral, a workout, or a performing program. But when borrowers are in forbearance, credit reporting is impacted, and we will talk about credit reporting in a minute. There are various state laws that have occurred. We aren't going to talk about them now, but they're in the slides for you to look at. And we've given some examples of possibilities and things to happen for forbearance in California, Washington, DC, Maryland, New York, Oregon. But there has been litigation with forbearance. Sean, what can you share? Yes, sir. There hasn't been, thankfully, there hasn't been too much litigation in the forbearance world, but there has been some litigation. Um, it's kind of come in two varieties. Um, one variety, and it's all been class actions that we've seen. The first screen you're seeing here are three class actions, which were of the one variety. Specifically in this variety, um, the borrowers um, were put into forbearance plans that they either didn't want or didn't know about, and they didn't give their consent. And uh, by doing this, this had the effect of terminating workout options that they might have preferred, as well as having negative credit impacts on them. Um, also, some um, some borrowers were um, 
you know, it took basically the, the, the note of this was it was taken away their choice and was not well received. All these cases were stayed pending settlement and mediation. So that leads us to believe it got past the motion to dismiss phase, making these, you know, very colorable claims and things that the CFPB and other regulators would not for, would not uh, approve of. So, you know, the moral story here is make sure if you're going to put someone in forbearance, you actually have proof of their consent to that forbearance. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Sandy. This is an example of the other version. Of the <clears throat> here, this is where the borrower wanted to be offered certain forbearance, but they were not being offered the forbearance that was actually permitted by the CARES Act. Um, whether that be on the initial term or extended terms, or maybe they were not advised of extended terms, um, the borrowers were thus, you know, restricted about what they could about what they could get. Um, there was also allegations that the servicers were not were asking for things that were not required under the various programs. They were requiring actual agreements to be executed. They were requiring certifications that were not required. So, you know, the point is, if there's a program in place. Give them that program. Do not ask for things that are outside that program and do not describe it in a way that undercuts the program. And definitely don't put them in the program if they don't ask for it. Ultimately, this case, um, the Fisher case, was also settled as well. So we haven't seen too much of this yet, but that's because forbearance has been kind of easy to get. Also, foreclosure and eviction moratoriums have been in place. But once all these moratoriums left and once forbearance is done and once the CFPB rule comes to an end, you can expect you're going to hear a ton about this type of stuff. As we give borrowers accommodations, there's new credit reporting rules under the CARES Act. We want to highlight it because it's been a trap for servicers. Subsection F was added to section 1681 S2A1, which says if you give the borrower an accommodation, and all that is is changing their payment terms in any way, shape, or form from January 31st, 2020, a month before the pandemic, two months before the CARES Act, until 120 days after the national emergency terminates, then two things happen. One, if the borrower was current and you give them an accommodation, you have to keep reporting the loan is current. If the borrower was delinquent and you give them an accommodation, you have to report them as that level of delinquent and no more so. If the borrower starts getting caught up or getting ahead, you have to do a better credit reporting. In summary, you must credit report the borrower in the best light possible if you're doing credit reporting and cannot harm them. This has certain side effects. Some of them is we can't rely on the credit reports anymore because a borrower might not have made a payment for a year who's in forbearance. And we're told the borrower is current. What many servicers and lenders are doing is they are asking either, hello borrower, are you in forbearance? And as you know, borrowers always tell the truth. So many times as part of the loan application process, lenders are asking for former servicers or current servicers payment histories to check it out. The second thing is while you have to report current and you wanna use comment codes, this is a problematic area and we want to ex express extreme caution should be taken. And while there's a whole program we can do on it, we merely wanted to highlight it's an issue now. How much of an issue is it? Well, litigation in the Credit Reporting Act is surging. The CFPB received 445,000 complaints in 2020, 50% more than in 2019, and two thirds of them were related to credit reporting. If we look at the breakdown, the number one types of complaints, almost 200,000, was credit reporting, credit repair services, and personal credit reports. The number two complaint, 667,000, credit reporting, credit repair services, and personal complaints with respect to credit reporting. And the number five complaint was an improper use of a credit report. Okay, so what can you do? Remember that there is no private right of action unless the consumer goes to the credit reporting agency and you fail to investigate. If the consumer complains to you directly or complains through the credit reporting agency, pretty please investigate it and fix the issue. If you've done it right, let the consumer know you've done it right. 
Don't rely on technicalities here and say, hey, we don't have to investigate because you haven't reported to the CRA. Yeah, investigate, save yourself a lawsuit. What kind of litigation are we potentially facing, Chris? Well, I can tell you that I had a conversation with uh, two uh, plaintiff's lawyers that only practice in the area of mortgage servicing litigation. I, I say only, that's 80% of what they do. And they have told me that they expect uh, FICRA claims to be uh, what they're going to be spending a lot of their time on in the coming years. Now, we'll see if that comes to be. But, you know, what, what we expect to see is the same kind of uh, claims you've seen in the past, maybe just a little bit more on steroids as more lawyers move into this space. Uh, because I, I do think um, we're going to see a lot of litigation and people are going to jump on the bandwagon. Uh, expect to see claims over miscommunications at, at the time that servicing transfers. So, uh, you know, a, a borrower is told by one servicer that they're going to report uh, a debt in a certain way, and then that's not clearly communicated to the new servicer or in the onboarding process, uh, the computers, somebody didn't check the right box, and so it gets reported in a way that it shouldn't under the CARES Act. Um, you know, there's always also going to be situations where even if the servicers um, do it properly and uh, report information, they don't have control over what's done with the report once they put it out there. So you end up with a situation where possibly the CRA will take what's a neutral credit information and report it in such a way that it, it uh, dings the borrower and they're going to file a lawsuit against the servicer. Uh, or you could have a user that reads n neutral credit information because uh, particularly since we know we can't really rely on the credit reports right now with all the forbearances um, and then treats it as negative and that could generate lawsuits. Um, you know, you're also going to see uh, a lot of state law claims uh, based on compliance with the CARES Act as people try to get around, uh, you know, federal preemption that uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act grants them. So you're going to see a lot of UDAP claims and things like that. What have we learned? We've been in the pandemic for more than a year and a half. We have suffered through the Great Recession, and we applied many of those lessons here, and they're working. The lessons that we take away are outreach works. Reach out to and make contact or try and make contact with your borrowers. Even if you don't succeed in making contact, merely trying is sufficient for the court authorities and regulators who look over our shoulders. Yes, you tried, you did your best, good job. Thanks, mom, I feel better. And it's great, that's the first thing. Second thing is many of these solutions are less paperwork. Recall during the Great Recession, you had the HAMP program. You got an application, you got supporting documents, the documents timed out, you had to get the same document again, and the borrower said, I kept sending them the same thing over and over again because it kept expiring. This time around, there was less paperwork, and the federal government shared and took on the risk. The focus and thrust of the regulations has been to keep borrowers in their homes, help them with credit reporting, and more importantly, if they can't keep their home, to keep their equity. What Fannie, Freddie, CFPB, FTC, and the OCC all learned is industry feedback is critical. Talk to your regulators. Many times regulators would hear complaints from servicers and lenders, and they would change regulations and guidance. One example is the mortgage pass-throughs. Three months of interest, boom, we're done, and it worked. We want to caution to prepare for the right wave. The moratoria are up. The Bureau's rule expires at the end of the year. There's a bunch of borrowers, millions of borrowers, in fact, 15% of our loans, for example, where borrowers either haven't reached out, we haven't made contact, or they've given up, and there's going to be the foreclosure wave. When the foreclosure starts, there's going to be litigation, and we can best protect ourselves by having done everything we could in advance to outreach, offer solutions, and say, hey, we tried, you didn't take advantage of our help. We're still willing to work with you, but stop blaming us for your inability to pay the mortgage despite all the tools we're giving you. Sean, what would you like to share? 
Uh, yeah, sure. I guess a couple of final thoughts, um, sort of echoing what Chris said earlier, you know, be careful how you communicate with your borrowers as far as your scripts that you provide them. And, and by the way, we'll go ahead and get you some scripts that can be circulated hereafter. But be careful what you have in your scripts. Be careful what your people are communicating and be careful what they're putting in their notes. Um, I feel like most um, the cases I get a lot of times are what I call just bad customer care. You, know, you represented one thing, but you wrote something else. Look at, um, and also go and look at anything you have in writing. I mean, whatever's on your website is the first thing any smart borrower's attorney is going to try to use against you. So if there's something you're doing on your website that's inconsistent with what you actually do, they're going to use that against you. Likewise, look at your internal policies and procedures. Now, these are things that typically don't have to get turned over, but um, if they do, you want to make sure that your procedures actually follow follow those policies and procedures and that you're not somehow violating your own policies and procedures. Um, and then just one other small little piece is I know it costs a lot to send tracked mail and we don't do that a lot unless we're talking about like a notice of default or, you know, a super key document. But you might want to consider adding a few more, you know, tracked mail pieces, you know, so you can show that they actually receive the loss mitigation package, maybe maybe you sent 30, but maybe every 10th has some kind of track mail or quarterly notice. That just might all be very helpful as well. So those are a couple of my thoughts. Bruce? Well, uh, I want to echo something that Sean said about the policies and procedures. And, and I think and I think it's what he, uh, not only look at your policy and procedures, but then go to the department that's handling your foreclosures and your, you know, your communications with your bars and walk through the process and make sure that your actions follow the policies. Too often, I think people review the policies and procedures and say, those look good. We're fine. You know, without realizing that there's been deviations uh, by the business unit um, that uh, legal's not aware of. So that's important. Obviously, you want to make sure you've uh, followed through with all the prerequisites that are required before you proceed with uh, foreclosure or eviction. You want to document it, uh, as Sean has indicated. Um, and again, reach out to your borrowers as often as you can and as soon as you can, and make sure that you have offered them all of the loss myth alternatives that are out there before you proceed with any um, foreclosure or, or eviction action. Truly, thank you all for joining us today. 